like she mentioned there, and she's correct, <coughs> that at least before they started changing that, you'll find out. You'll need that meets and bounds to get a hold of the Bureau of Land Management, the main office in your state, and request three certified copies, three certified copies of the original land patent that affects your land. Yes, sir. Do you also see that STR section township range abbreviated that way? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Real estate. Okay. I don't know what they are in Montana, but in the state of Oregon, I think they're $2.50 a piece. Get them certified, and I'll get into why. Okay? Once you receive that, your copies of the three copies of the certified plan patent, you now either have a number of options. You either want to go to the county recorder's office, some of it you can do online, and you being in real estate, I don't know how much uh, in-depth information or how far back you can go to research the chain of title or abstract of title. <clears throat> you must be a named owner by virtue of the document that you have that shows that you are entitled and in, at the end of the chain of title as a present to bring your land patent forward. You have to be a land owner, a property owner. It's a requirement. <clears throat> Okay? Once you receive that document and you go to the county recorder's office, you can hire people who do that kind of research. The title companies will do it usually for a fee. But you want to get what's called an extensive chain of title or a complete chain of title. All the way from the patent. And here's how you verify it. When you get that document by whoever has done the research, Compare it with your land patent relative to the meets and bounds. They don't have all of this new stuff on that document. Those are archive records. So they're going to have to have your meets and bounds <clears throat> in order to go to the record, the archive record, and pull your document that's applicable to your land. Are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. If I'm not, stop me because it's important that you understand the sequence of events and the number and the items that need to be done. Am I making myself clear? Okay. Don't be afraid to speak up. You don't hurt my feelings. So I don't want to assume that you understand or know if you don't. And there's no embarrassment if you don't. Speak up. <clears throat> Those documents that you have, if you're paying somebody to do it, if you're paying a title company to do it, make sure, emphasize verbally and in writing that you want them all certified. You say, oh, it costs some money. Yeah, it does. But if you ever get a challenge against it, I'm going to tell you what happens. The reason that you get certified documents Let's just say that these folks here have done their land patent. And I come along and I say, I'm going to challenge this. You know what responsibility falls on me to challenge their land patent document? Yeah. She'll understand this because she's in the real estate business and maybe some of you else will. I now would have the burden of disqualifying every single certified agent who certified those documents before I can ever touch the document or attempt to touch the document. That's the power of the certification of those documents. It's the best insurance that you can possibly have when you're bringing a land patent forward. Get them certified. Yes, sir? need to make a point as well that you need to have it certified that, that the day that you take it out of the records and the copy, the day that you make the copy. And you can't make copies of all your uh, your chain of title and come back some other day and get it certified. You have to get it certified that day. 
I'm not, I have a little hearing problem. What I'm understanding you to say that you had to get them certified that day? Get, them, get the copies that you get of your chain of title, get them certified that day. Yes, yes, don't good, come back, good point. Don't come back later and That's back correct. get them certified later. You want that to be certified before you take possession of it. That way there's no question. I don't have anything to do with it. This lady or man, they're the ones qualified and, and have authority to certify it. If I'm going to come and challenge your land patent, I have to destroy every single certification, <coughs> including the BLM and the original land patent. You with me? Quite sure. You talk about insurance, folks. When you're talking about a piece of property that's 200,000, 300,000, a million, whatever the number is, pretty good insurance or two or three hundred dollars to spend on certification of those documents. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you do that. In the 45 years that I've done this, <clears throat> I've only seen two challenges. Neither one of them prevailed, and guess why? Absolutely. They were all certified. And the court said, Where's your standing to challenge the certification? See, any issue in court can be addressed upon a debate. It's called discretion. <clears throat> you want to reach up and you want to take away that court's discretion. And how you take it away is that this is certified. See the stamp? Because here's the problem with me, the pursuer, after your property. I don't have anything that's certified relative to the chain of title in most instances. And I've seen that attempted twice, and both times. The moving party lost. Judge threw them out to get out of here. Pretty good insurance, folks. Okay? Once you have that, those certified documents, you only need to get, by the way, one full copy of your chain of title certified. Once you have your complete sandwich done, and we'll get into that in a minute, you need to make three separate copies plus the original. And it's only for safekeeping. The original is not what you post once it's done, and I'm getting a little ahead of it here. But <clears throat> when you go to post this in a public place, a courthouse, a fire station, library, wherever you're going to post it, <clears throat> do a true copy. Do not post the original. When you go to record it after the 61-day period, you must take the original because they will give that back to you. Now, we've had a lot of problems throughout the western United States, in fact, all over the United States, in certain instances of the recorder not wanting to record it. I got a whole deal of law here that requires them to record it, and we'll get into that afterwards here. Are you with me this far? Am I losing anybody about it? Yes, ma'am. When you say post the chain of title. Hang on a second. <clears throat> when you say post the chain of title, are you talking about just the summary of chain of title or each, all the documents? No, you have a good question. Her question was, do you have to have this to summary? You will make a summary from your chain of title. And I show that, and you'll see it in my documents here in a minute. But you want to have the total, complete enchilada, if I can put it in that term. That way there's nothing missing. Nobody can say, hey, you got an incomplete file. Now you intend to commit fraud. You see how the how attorneys work and devious people? You want, and boy, you understand that point well. Your documents get used against you. Exactly. So you don't want to have anything missing. Do not alter those documents. You leave them 
as you receive them in the certified. But you want to go through them and make sure that they're complete, and especially the certified copy out of the county of your original purchase agreement. You with me? Make sure that that is copathetic, page by page, line by line, etc. Yes? On a certification, who certifies and what type of certification are you speaking of? District certification that the county recorder's office gives. It's all that you need. But it did, they'll stamp it. Normally they'll use a, well, different places. You do. Some just put an ink stamp. Some of them use an, what is it, an embossing or whatever the, the imprint <coughs> on it. The BLM will send you a document, at least they do from Oregon, the Portland office. They'll encrypt that there, and then they will stamp it on the back. So when you get it, look front and back to see what has been done with it. Yes? If your meets and bounds are different. Speak up, please. If your meets and bounds are different, what document do you refer to as the one to go off of? I'm not sure what you mean by that the meets and bounds will differ. Well, you made the, you made the point in here that, um, if I can find it, you have to make sure that they are, all the descriptions are the same. That is correct. And if they're not the same, what happens? You go back to, again, it, it depends <clears throat> upon whether you're looking at your document of your original purchase or whether you're looking at a certified copy. You've got to backtrack to find out why there's a discrepancy. And there are errors in that stuff, too. Okay? And so you go to the earliest document for the most correct. accurate That is correct. Now, let me mention something in addition to that point. The whole basis of bringing your land patent forward is contingent upon that BLM reference to the meets and bounds. That is not going to change. You can't change it, I can't change it, and it will not be changed. So whatever that meets and bounds is, that's the framework you've got to work with. Yes? I was just going to put a comment. We're in the land search business. I do... Uh, you need to speak up so I can hear you. We do land and mineral search. We've been, we've been running title for quite a number of years. If your meets and bounds are different, and they are different, you're on the wrong property. That's, it could not be an error. Yeah. And it's just quite common in some areas, especially with the lady said over there with subdivision and stuff, or right. parcels or stuff, you may be on the wrong property. In other words, the document you, document you have is not yours. And that's why it's important, and he has a very valid point. Check that stuff out, item by item. Take pains to research and read it carefully, yes. What happens if a property has been subdivided since the patent, and you're only doing, a, just, like it was 160 acres, and you're only dealing with 20? But you can still go back and determine where in that, whatever that meets and down was, where this subdivision portion is. And I deal with a lot of that. Okay. And people want to add the, the tax lot for the sake of getting the patent from the Bureau of Land Management. It's irrelevant. That patent didn't know anything about a subdivision. Okay? Right, but if, but if but your name wouldn't be, like if you're out talking about a, a portion of a subdivision, your name's not going to be attached to that whole subdivision. It's only going to be your portion. That is correct. On the BLM records, and they won't have that, all the parcels. But that, that doesn't affect what you require and are asking of the BLM. It's irrelevant. Because what's relevant is the meets and bounds when they issued that land patent. And See, we want to, I'm sorry. You're within that. That is correct. You, that's why you, you exactly. That's why you need to know where you're located in because if you post this document on the board and you claim somebody else's land, there are people going to jail for that. These documents are legal documents, folks, and they need to be done correctly. Yes? Is it going to matter if in your chain of title or your land is on a government lot? What's considered a government lot? No. Yes, ma'am. Would it involve a, a survey, or should you have it surveyed to be sure that a number of people have done that because there has been some confusion about it. But the, whoever does the survey needs to go back 
to the county survey records and make sure because we used to do everything by the tripod and the, and the transit and whatever. A lot of the stuff now is done with GPS, and there are some variances in that. And people like this lady up here that deal in real estate, you find that quite often because the land descriptions would go down to the very foot. Yes? What does government lot mean that Senator Fielder brought up? The government lot? Well, the government had land holdings in different locations for proposed arsenal, for proposed post office, or for, you know, whatever, who knows, whatever. <coughs> so, yes, sir. How the posting, how do you, how, what's the ways you can post it? How do you post it? Yeah, you get your package done. I mean, do you advertise it in a newspaper? Do you you can, we'll get into that, so let's hold off on that for the time being, yes. Uh, my understanding of government lot up in our area was a discrepancy. It wasn't quite 40 acres. It would be 39.5, and so they call it a government lot. And, and there is. Or yes. whatever. Right. But a lot of government lots and stuff were intended for either right-of-way or road or something that they were going to build. A whole lot of things can be involved in that. Correction. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Ron, you've been doing this for a lot of years. Have you ever seen a land patent sell to a new owner? What percentage from your experiences have you seen has gone up in value? To me, you pack the land, that, that's got to be worth a lot more than a warranty deed. Well, it, it is. There are some drawbacks to a land patent. Not many, but there are some. And it is simply this, and I want to mention, thank you for bringing that up. <clears throat> All of the benefits of a land patent that we pretty much covered, there are some more, and we'll get into that. But the, the negative side, if you want to sell that land patent, then in essence, you, the person buying it or acquiring it, needs to have the cash to pay you because they can't go into a bank and get it financed. A bank will not finance on a land patent. So it turns into a warning by me that Joe Smith wants to buy it for a lender. You could convert it back but then you lose all of the, the benefit. If you're going to look at selling your land and you want somebody the availability, you have to make the decision, well, do you want to bring the land patent forward? There are a lot of benefits from it, but a bank will not loan. Why not? Why will not a bank loan on a land patent? They can't collaterally exactly. attack it. They can't even lean it. They can put a lien on the person's signature. But the bank mortgage and your land are not one and the same. Yes? Well, can't you have both? Yeah. A land patent and a warranty deed? No. Because a warranty deed represents a marketable title. And you know what that means in real estate. Something that you're able to sell. And with a land patent, then in essence, technically and lawfully, you can't sell a land patent. You can convey it, you can sell the building on it, but say you got a, I'll just pick a number, half a million dollar property. The land you grant, you grant, which means you give it. But you can get your half a million dollars for the, even though they're getting the land. But the legal documents required of that, lawfully, you're not supposed to sell a land patent. Yes? I have a follow-up question, sir. So let's say I have a piece of property, and I did this land patent deal, and I want to sell it to Joe Smith. And Joe Smith is just in the 99% database and can't buy my land with cash. My question is specifically, do I need to change my land patent back to a warranty deed, or would the title company do that? Real quick. I mean, you, they, they would do it if you give them authorization to do it. But that brings up my question. Why then, excuse me, would you go all to the trouble, time, and expense to bring your land back and forward? You're going to turn right around and sell it. I understand, but what if it's in, in your investment portfolio and part of your. Income? And you can do that, sure. Just build an outhouse that. on it and sell it for half a million. Remember. <laughs> remember. 
that you relinquish all the protective covenants by doing that. But if my database of buyers is really small, okay. I might have to do that. Okay. And you might. Yeah. Okay. But again, that's your freedom of choice to do that. But to answer your question, yes. What's the situation with the mortgage land? If you have a loan on the property and you bring a patent title, title forward, will it trigger a due on sale clause if you hold the mortgage? A mortgage cannot infringe or collaterally a land patent. Even if it's in place before you Even if it's in place. If you've got a mortgage, you can still do your land patent process, absolutely. That mortgage, again, is not tied to the land. That's what they've been doing, and that's what I'm trying to help you folks understand. There's a severance or the division between the mortgage and its authority and jurisdiction and your right of the land under a land patent. If not, then it ties it up because it's an, under, under another jurisdiction. Okay? But a mortgage is nothing but a lien. And I'm going to get into it a little bit today. But let me put it this way. I have challenged and helped people challenge mortgage foreclosure for about seven years now. And in every instance, we have proven that the bank, mortgage company, never loaned you a dime. What did you say, Ron? They never loan you a dime. The mortgage companies, the bank, for 35, almost a oh, little over 40 years, actually, lend their credit. It's unlawful. I've got case law galore. I wish I'd have brought some of it for you. But I didn't want to get off into the mortgage thing too much, because that's a whole subject itself. They extend you their credit. Your land purchase comes from the power of your signature. We say, well, how does that work? Very simple. When you were born, within seven days of your birth, they, they issue a birth certificate. The original one that's issued is a certificate of live birth. Huh? What are you talking about, Ron? I'm talking about there's been fraud committed upon your mother and your father and against you if you have children. That birth certificate is then sent, the original one, with your parent's signature on it to the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and they hold that. That birth certificate has a number. It's your birth certificate number. Now, your birth certificate number is your social security, but it wasn't always that way. The IMF holds that and they monetize it. When you go through a real estate agent or direct purchase, you sign that document at closing, you have a three-day revocation period to withdraw your signature. I think it's the same in Montana, is it? It's not. It's not okay. on a purchase, on a refinance. Pardon? It is not on a purchase, it is on a refinance. Just on a refinance? Okay. In Oregon, you have a three-day revocation. In other words, if you sign it today, you can withdraw your signature as long as you do it within three days. Okay? What they do with your signature is they then, on the fourth day, at least from the ones in Oregon and the ones that have a, a, a time period of revocation, they send it to the IMF. The IMF forwards the money out of your account that was established by virtue of your birth certificate. In other words, they've already got paid for your property. I've proven this in court. Numerous other attorneys who represent a client. We do, when we challenge these types of, of mortgage issues, we do it, and we perform what is called a securitization audit. And what a securitization audit does, it follows your signature from the very document you sign, who it went to, what they did with it to the IMF, and every place when they bundled them up and the investment groups bought them, they then turn and sell or send them to an underwriter. The underwriter then evaluates them. They then send them to Dun & Bradstreet. Dun & Bradstreet rates them. 
and then they send them to Wall Street and they're put on the market. All the time, you're getting a payment. Look, fraud. We've proven fraud. It's been proven over and over and over. They never loan you any money. They loan you their credit. I got court cases galore on. Yes. That document, the live birth certificate, is usually found at Health and Human Services. Yes. At least in the Midwestern state, yeah. that's where I found it. And it's also found in the Office of Vital Statistics. So, but they won't give you the original. They will give you the altered one. And it'll say birth certificate, not certificate of live birth. Yes. I'm trying to follow this part of it. So why doesn't everybody go to the bank, get a warranty deed, do a lender, and a few months later, because they don't know what it's about. But understand, you don't want to do this for the sake of creating another problem. There's enough misrepresentation out there. What I'm sharing with you, the reason that you want, I'm suggesting, let me rephrase that, to bring your land patent forward is to protect the foreclosure possibility on your land. If you leave it in real estate, I guarantee you they're going to take it. Yes? Well, within the bounds of reservation, the tribe, the federal government, well, the tribal lawsuit that they filed in January claims that there was never anyone who proved up their fee patent status so that none of the fee patents issued are valid, nor did the Secretary of Interior have right to issue water rights. So they're saying the aboriginal title was never broken and no one has ever brought forward their fee patent so the land still belongs to the tribe. Well, there are some problems with that. <clears throat> Simply because case law shows, and I've researched a lot of that, that there is a statute of limitation to challenge that. And, and we're going to get into that later on this afternoon, hopefully. But to, to address your particular point, once a patent is issued, unless it has a subject to clause of improvement of property, such as you mentioned, then in essence stands forever. If there is that, that reservation, and that's what we call them in patent language, a reservation, then in essence, if they did not improve it. Now, let me give you an example to illustrate your point. In Oregon, we have seven counties that were affected by legislation back in 1937. It's called the ONC Act, Oregon and California. And the purpose for that is we have tremendous timber wealth where I live. And in that, it was determined by Congress if the economy went up or down because those communities in those seven counties were totally dependent upon the timber revenues, okay? And for those of you who work in county government or whatever understand, well, that's a, a yo-yo line. They implemented an act of Congress called the ONC Act that stated that timber will be harvested to the fullest no matter what the economic condition is. Well, then the environmentalists come along and they say, we got a lizard, we got a spotted owl. Those weren't reasons, they were excuses to strangle the economy of our part of the country and, and yours as well. So we started to do an investigation. I was part of the investigative team to determine where the legal standing was. And I met with some timber people by the name of Swansons. They own a mill, in fact, only the one with a few mills left. <coughs> Had a meeting with the county commissioners. And we addressed the issue that by a congressional grant and the legislation is, in fact, a grant. Why don't you pursue it on the basis of the grant? And that attorney for uh, Swanson Lumber Company said, wow. And I said, let me back it up. And I pulled out of my file a New Mexico versus United States 1978 case. The Supreme Court said in that case, said that the, the Organic Act in 1897 that established the National Forest were for two reasons. Two, they were for the 
continual harvest of timber, and it was for the continual supply of water. Two reasons. None of this environmental garbage, the recreation stuff, was not a part of that enactment. That's a luxury. That's not a right relative to the organic debt. And when I presented that to that attorney, and I gave him a copy of it, man, I mean, he backed away from the table, and he's going through that like Sherman through Georgia. <laughs> and he said, where did you get this? I said, it's part of my file. He then went and talked to his uh, bosses, the uh, Swanson Group, some brothers, a family-owned timber uh, mill. They filed suit, and they won. The federal court said that the Bureau of Land Management, you're to start harvesting timber to the full amount under the ONC Act. So now they're getting ready to start harvesting timber. It's not in our country. County. Yes. Is that ONC Act applicable only to Oregon and California, or is that then brought based over the rest of the state? No, it's only applicable to those seven counties. Seven mm -hmm. counties. Okay. I don't know what Montana has. I haven't done that much research into the timber side of Montana, <clears throat> but uh, the ONC Act was for the purpose of continual harvest of timber so that the tax revenues that would come off that would sustain the counties, that they were resource counties. And it gutted those counties, literally gutted, because then industry wouldn't come in simply because then they wanted to stack all the tax load on the new industry. And they had not county facilities to support the new industry. Ron, you said it was 1978? 1937. It's called the ONC Act. You can go to the computer, Google it in, you all do it in, whatever. What was that, Organic Act? The Organic Act, 1897. That's what created the National Forest, officially. That only affects Pardon? the seven counties or the whole National Forest? Yeah, of all of the National Forest. So that would have put in Montana also? No. Yes. The only the organic. It established all of the national forests. Okay? And then they split them up to portion the low level stuff was handled by the Bureau of Land Management and the certain elevation and above is to be the Department of Agriculture U.S. Forest Service. Okay? So getting back to the patent issue, once you get those documents, your chain of title, you have your certified copies from the Bureau of Land Management, now we're going to construct the document itself. This is very critical, and I want to take you to that. <clears throat> you go to page 118. And I want you to pay very close attention. And there's a reason for this. Are you all there that are going there? OK. At the very top of this document, you want to put the United States of America and in the Republic State of Montana. OK? Now, notice that the state is in lowercase. I didn't make a mistake. I didn't blow it. There's a reason for it. You're talking about a republic state, not a corporate state. This document refers back to the original patent, which is under constitutional law, which is virtually uh, uh, based upon common law. We're talking about the republic standing here. And this is one of mine, personally. <clears throat> and I put Ron Gibson, care of P.O. Box, da 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 You put your address in there, Republic, U.S., lowercase, America, uppercase. And underneath that, I have non 
dash domestic. Ron, why did you do that? I'll tell you why. You want to be very, very careful and sure that you are not subjecting yourself into administrative jurisdiction. Because if you do, it invalidates this document and it's standing to you carry that land down and forward. Okay? Does everyone understand that? So when you go to do your document or Rex is helping you with it or whatever, you want to make very careful that the items are followed that I've got and then we're going to get into some more items. Somebody held their hand up. Yes? I'm sorry? Yes, you can send it. But can you put your actual address in there? If you put your actual address or post office box, the law says that you have to, to list where your domicile. Domicile can be your workplace, it can be your home, or whatever, or where you get mail. I've had people try to tell me, well, that isn't lawful for you to do it that way. I looked it up, and it is lawful to do it. You have those three options. Okay? <clears throat> Do not, do not use a zip code. I'm going to tell you a little story about a zip code. When you use a zip code, you are acknowledging and surrendering your address, home, business, whatever it is, that you are in a federal district. When you do that, all of the government will stuff that comes out of the northbound steer subject you to that jurisdiction. I've had people argue, and I wish I'd have brought it, and I don't want to get into it all today, don't have time. Your zip code, you're making acknowledgement that you are under federal jurisdiction. Yes? Would I need to make a declaration of my domicile then? No. I don't want to get into the whole thing about domicile, but no, you know, because you have you to change keep your yourself domicile. out. As long as you don't use capital letters in your name, you can use upper and lower, but that's your Christian name. But you do not use capital letters and do not use a zip code. As far as the name goes, does that apply for uh, if it was an LLP or an LLC? I mean, it's the ent ownership entity, or does it have to be a personal name? No, it has to be brought forward in your personal land. That has major problems. Yeah. Major problems. Yeah. Patents were issued for the individual. For well, people, not now, for the <laughs> Well, there's a remedy to that. Don't, don't get discouraged. There's a remedy to that. Okay? Quit claiming it to an individual, do your land patent, and then do your conveyance back to the corporation of that. That's done all the time. Yes? Are there any other restrictions that you put, you know, so I live at 112 something road or avenue or anything? No, whatever your address is, that works. You'd write out the word right. rather than RD period or what? Okay. Yeah, whatever your address is, that's what it is. But do not use a zip code. Yes? If your land patent has been filed with the, social, or with the uh, zip code, can, and can you correct that and then refile it? Yes. Yes, you can. <clears throat> so you have to post it again and go through all that? No. All you have to is to post as, as an amendment to that document. You have to post it on the board for public view, yes. For 61 days? Huh? Yes, yeah, for 60 days. 61. Right. Pardon? Yeah, for 61. Yeah, 61 days. Yes, sir. They're going to return this with that, that kind of address on it without a zip or anything? I'm sorry, okay, so they going to, Are you going to get this back from them without a zip code and it in that format? That's it doesn't go anywhere, but you pin it up on a book. Oh, you're not going to send this no. to the BLM? No, BLM yeah. has nothing to do with it. All right. Nothing to do with it. Oh. Okay. How many places do you have to pin it up? Pardon? How many places do you have to post it? You have to post it for 61 days. Oh, in any public building, courthouse, the firehouse, the library, post office, post office, within your county. yes, has to be within your county. 
What if somebody, whether it be a dump reporter or anybody, takes it down prior to the season? We're going to get to that. You have a very good question. That's why you make multiple copies, remember me? Now remember, we haven't got into it yet because we're jumping all over here. We're going to make a summary of your chain of title. <clears throat> That's usually a one or two page document. Because whatever you make up in this sandwich, we call it, you're going to pin that with two pegboard pins onto a bulletin board. Okay? So. You don't want 50 pounds of paper hanging on two little pins. Won't stay up. Now, to answer your question, and a very good question. If somebody comes along and takes it down, you want to check on your posting at least one a week, once a week. When you go to check, take you a true copy with you to replace it. Now, we're going to get into the note that goes on the bottom left-hand corner, and I'll get into that in a minute that this document is to be posted for a minimum of 61 days. And then you put the starting date, put that date. And then you put the ending date and put thank you and initial it. And I, what I do is I usually use, either use a three by five card or a sticky, but the sticky staple it on each 45 degree angle. You put a sticky on there in two days, it'll fall off. Okay? But you're notifying any person looking at that document that that's to be left there and is required to be posted for 61 days. You with me? All righty. This is a notice document. <clears throat> you notice underneath my address, non-domestic, it said notice of. When you have a notice of, it means to everyone concerned. You don't have to put to whom it may concern. <clears throat> this is a notice, because that's what you're posting as a notice. And this is, you're posting a certificate of acceptance of the declaration of land pet. Now, let's address the certificate issue. <clears throat> in law, to bring a land patent forward, you must accept what has already been done. Because the patent's already been done, hasn't it? To bring that forward, you've got to accept the authority and jurisdiction <clears throat> and the rights that go along with that. That's what this document does. <clears throat> and you have to do it to all the world in a public notice and a public place. Are you with me thus far? Yes. You can also post it in a newspaper, can't you? Yes, you can. Thank you. You can post it in a newspaper. <clears throat> the disadvantage to putting it in a paper takes quite a bit of space. In other words, you're going to pay to have it. Yes. You have to post it. You only have to post it in a newspaper that prints it. Hang on a second, Rex. The newspaper you post it in must print at least one day a week. If you print, if you post it in the yes. flathead paper, they print every day, and it'll cost you six hundred dollars mm -hmm. for yeah. the sixty-one days. Yeah. So in those cases, you're better off to post it. Did you hear what he said? The cost and that it would cost to put it in for the sixty days about six hundred bucks to get it in the newspaper. A daily paper. So, or whatever the cost may be. If it's a weekly paper, it's quite a bit less than that. Pardon? If it's a weekly paper, it's only once a week. No. Okay. okay, but whatever, all I'm saying is that whatever it costs, you're going to have to pay for that. When you post it on a bulletin board, it doesn't cost you your time and two pegs and your, your paperwork. Ron, so are you suggesting that if you go the newspaper posting route, you have to put Every document in this five documents uh, yes. sandwich? You bet. Not just the no. You've got to put it all. Can you shrink it's it? It's all a legal document. Can you shrink it? Can they be, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can shrink it. Yeah. You're talking about the document with accompanied by the chain of title. I'm sorry, say again? The notice accompanied by the chain of title? 
you have your summary of chain of title. All, all five? All the good. documents so that I have. Just in the it. summary page or the actual documents? Too? No, the summary page. Okay. Yeah. okay. All you're doing is alluding to that, and then you have another notice page we'll get to. Let's hold off and we'll get to that, and I appreciate the question. But there are certain things that you have to do in sequence. It needs to be in the order that I've shown there for the purpose. That way everything is in sequential order, yes. If you own numerous parcels that are contiguous out of the same general tract or township range section, can you do one posting or do you have to have one for each part? For each individual piece of property has to be done separate. Now, there have been instances where people own multiple properties within the same patent boundary. Yeah. In that case, you use the same patent, but all of your other chain of title and everything has to be separate. Yes? Ron, if you're challenged, uh, how do you prove that you posted and that it was posted? We're going to get into that. Days. I'll show you how to do that and do it effectively. Yes? Ron, I'm trying to keep my question to the end, but I, I was not able to vote two elections. I'm a landowner taxpayer, and um, my road in, in, in the country doesn't have a number, so I used a post office box. And they wouldn't let me vote. Yeah. Two, two elections. And that should be my domicile. But I had to have a number on the road, but I find it took me, I had a tax bill, I had everything, but in Montana, uh, if you just put a post on this box, it doesn't work. Yeah. <coughs> but all I'm saying, a, a post office box is a lawful domicile. For the purpose of this document, okay. this has nothing to do with voting, and I'm not throwing stones there. I'm saying, let's keep apples and apples here if you understand what I'm saying, okay? <clears throat> yes? Do the library and uh, the post offices you, and wherever, is there any problem with posting there? What if A lot of them will tell you we can't post that. Then what you say, every government office, every one of them, is required by law to have a place to post public notices. If they say we don't have that, we can't do it here, then you ask them politely, then where is the place that I am authorized, where is your place to post a public document? They have to provide it by law, okay? All right, let's move on. The certificate of acceptance. The land patent has to be accepted. And this is your verification and validation that you are accepting the original land patent. We're on page 118. And that notice is to the whole world. And it shows there the land patent. Do not just put patent. Do not put just patent. And the reason, there are all kinds of patents. But land patent is specific to the subject matter. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. You list the patent number. Now I want to go back to something that I neglected to say. The patents certified copies that you will receive from the Bureau of Land Management sometimes are not clear. When you contact them to get your copy of the land patent, the original certified land patent, Ask them to please make it for you as clear as they can. A number of people have brought land patents to me, and the number is blurred out or not copied. I got to sit down and have books. <clears throat> and <clears throat> therefore, on that basis, if you get a copy like that, call the Bureau of Land Management Archive Records Division and say, would you please verify the number and would you send me another one with the number? They can put the number on it, you cannot. That land patent number is absolutely essential to your document and to your authenticity of what you're doing. Yes? I had a request of that sort of the in Billings. And they said, no, if we put it in marketing, well, it won't be a, a copy. They refused to do it. That, that, I got two patents where yeah. you couldn't read the 
Did it have the number? Yeah. Okay. But in Portland, Oregon, they will tell you that you can't put the number, but they can. Because they're the they're what's called in law the custodians, uh, custodians of the archive records. That gives them certain privileges that they can do. And that's for authenticating documents. If the number on that land patent is not in fact clear, then they have the authority in which to verify and to prove that it is, or to send you, in the case that you just mentioned, to send you one with a clear number. So to alleviate that delay, tell them up front, please make sure that the signature and the dates on the patent are two critical elements, okay? And the land patent number. Because your whole document is predicated upon that identification of that number. <clears throat> you put the date of the land patent, mine was dated August 20th, 1866, and that's CSC attached. That means at the end of my document, there it is right there, I got the land patent. Okay, next item down, knowing all you men and women by these present. You're addressing everybody, in other words. I, Ron Gibson, do hereby certify and declare that I am an assignee in the land patent named above and numbered above, and that I have brought up the land patent in my name <clears throat> as it pertains to the land described below and the character <clears throat> uh, of the said land so claimed by uh, the patent and legally described and reference under the patent number listed above is da -da 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 -da, township 37 pound, range 1 west, southern uh, quarter of section 9, Willamette Meridian, uh, Oregon, containing 320 acres. See attached. And in my document, I have the attached. Okay? Number two, I, Ron Gibson, uh, is domiciled at P.O. Box, da -da 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 -da, Rome River, Oregon, Republic U.S., lowercase, capital A, non-domestic. Unless otherwise stated, I have individual knowledge of the matters contained in this certification and acceptance of declaration of patent. Land patent or patent? Pardon? Put land patent? Should be land patent. Okay. Yeah. Insert land patent. I didn't do it on this one, but all the ones since I've done. Okay. I am fully competent to testify with respect to these matters. You're saying, well, why is that in there? That's in there because it shows that you are, number one, competent to do this document. See, there's a problem in law of doing documents from incompetent people. You're proving here that you're competent. And who better to say that you're competent than you? Okay. <clears throat> like the guy said, well, I just wanted everybody to know I'm perfect. I don't know where you stand. But <laughs> okay. Number three. I, Ron Gibson, an assignee at law and in a bona fide subsequent purchaser by contract of certainly legally described portions of, the, of land patent under the original comma certified land patent and I refer to the number. I am being very specific here about what I'm talking about so that nobody can come along and say well you didn't have to really describe it and that happens. So you want to make sure that you properly identify what it is you're talking about and referring to. Very important. Ron, okay? Ron, are you saying I am an assignee at law because you're an attorney, or is that what we all put? That's what you all say. Okay. You're, what you're doing is in law. Assigning. Okay? In law. okay? What you're doing relative to this is lawful. Gotcha. 
and you're just stating that, okay? The only thing you change, or I would recommend that you change, is your particular land description, your patent number, your domicile, your name, that kind of stuff, okay? <clears throat> David, August 20th, 1866, would do the authorized and to be executed in pursuant of the supremacy of treaty law. Why do you suppose I put treaty law there? That's where the authority and jurisdiction came from for the patent, isn't it? Now here's what's interesting about that, folks. If you've got reference to the treaty, who and how are they going to defeat the treaty? That's why it's in there. This is an insurance policy, if I can put it in that context. You want to make sure that all of your ducks are in a row. Just in case. I have a saying called the 5P principle. Proper planning prevents poor performance. Okay? Do take the time. Use mine as a copy or have Rex help you with it. But you want to do these right. Yes? Um, using old language like that, basically, in a sense, you're saying it protects us from any new language coming. That is correct. Powers of okay. that's, that's exactly what it does. Okay? Okay, a treaty at law. <clears throat> Citation and constitutional mandate. Why did I mention that? Because it's mandated. And Where are the patents? By what authority are the patents issued? By the Constitution in it. Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. Herein, reference where, <clears throat> whereupon a duly authenticated, true, and correct lawful description. That's why your meets and bounds is important, folks. You want to be correct and accurate of your land description. I've read cases where people have done it wrong, some by accident, they got out of it, but they were charged with criminal theft of land. One lady in California was doing this to other people's land and trying to take their, by using this process. And it got the land patent process a real black eye by one woman who wanted to be a horse in behind. A crook, if you please. There's a moral obligation here as well as a legal one. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay. Together with all the hereditaments, uh, tenements, preemptive rights, appertents, there too, and lawful and valuable consideration which is <clears throat> appended here too and made a part of this notice a certificate of acceptance and declaration of land patent. See attached again. I did this so I want everybody to know I know what I'm talking about and I can prove it. Go see my attached document. Okay? Because you can't put the land patent on this document so just use the attached. Yes? Uh, why about your mineral rights? Hang on a moment. Okay, what about your mineral estate that came down with the patent? I'm sorry, say again, I'm sorry. The mineral estate. Okay. If it's still attached to your land, it came down from the land patent. If there is a mineral estate, it will state so on your land patent, and it will be signified by subject to about three quarters of the way down in your land patent. And I'll read one to you in a little bit. But if it has been severed from the land since the land patent. It doesn't change the process of the land patent. Because then you're dealing with only a surface estate. Well, okay? but sometimes like 50% of your mineral rights, has, like I've seen many instances where uh, the land bank foreclosed on farms and then they sell the farms at a sale and they keep the mineral rights. But I'm not sure of your question. Okay, if you want to protect those mineral rights, wouldn't you <coughs> include that in your... Then you do a separate filing on it and they can't sell it, they can't take it. Separate. 
And that's the reason, and there's a lot of case law on that very point. Thank you for being patient with me. I had some damage from Vietnam, and I had some kind of hard time here. But that is a separate estate. If there's a mineral on your property that was segregated out in the patent, if you have a patent and they later found, that's what I referred to earlier as the noble decision. Okay? But you document that. I've owned my own property, a file for the minerals underneath the land that I already owned. But it was a separate estate. It said so in the Homestead Certificate that I got, the patent. So I just went, filled out my paperwork, filed it with the county, sent it to the BLM, got an ORMC number on it. Now I own the mineral. They can't come and take the mineral. And I have a dominant right. Yes? Is there a way that all the people who have done this so far in the United States and everybody in this room can form a coalition? So if they come after one, they've got to come after us all? No, because they're individual. In other words, you could form a co-op for the sake of trying to protect each one. But the challenge could never be against all of them. No, not the challenge. But everybody jumps into the courtroom and fights. Well, certainly. If enough people went into the court, and you bring up a good point. You know, when you've got a neighbor, a friend, a relative going to court, get your hind end out of your chair and go and pack that courthouse. And I'll tell you what that does. I had a judge tell me, a judge told me this. He said, you know, he said, of anything that us judge fears, he said, it's a mass of the public. And I said, why is that? He said, because I got an election coming up pretty quick. I got an election coming up. Okay? Exactly. Exactly. They're afraid that enough people see the horse crap they're doing, they'll vote them out of office. You want your party to win, you pack that courtroom. That isn't good enough, and you put an article in the paper. In our county, we ran a judge clear out of the county, lost his judgeship and the whole thing, because he was horsing around and stomping on people's rights, and we said, that's it. And the people rose up, like the Bundy issue. They fear you and I people in numbers. They fear you. And especially if you're knowledgeable and know what you're talking about. Knowledge is power. Okay? And I'm going to move on, but use this as a guide. If you have any questions, Rex can help you. We're marching along in our time here. We need to take a break here in a little bit. Can I ask about maybe a typo that might be in there? Pardon? There might be a typo in number five, two of them. Just wondering. The middle line, it says, equitable interest on any end. Is there a word missing? Yes, it is. Thank you. What's missing? It should be in a court of law. Equitable interest in a court of law. So we are to strike out on any? Yes. No, not law, but interest in, block out, on any. And then the number is supposed to be 60? Yes. This is not the original one I did. This was my worksheet, and when I put it together, I used the wrong one. So, yes. Yeah, number four, you say, I have assigned the entire tract, but in a lot of cases, you would say a portion of that tract. You wouldn't have the whole thing like that. No, at the beginning, it puts no claim. The first word that he does not claim all of it. I have been assigned the entire tract of land. No claim. Described in the original patent, though. No claim is made that he claims it. Read the first couple words. Okay. 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 Ok
Okay. Right. Okay. Go on to number six. When a lawful, lawfully qualified sovereign, American individual, has a claim to title, is challenged the court of competent, original, and exclusive jurisdiction. That is such a critical statement, folks, because most courts are not courts of competent jurisdiction. And if you're going to be challenged, or if you are challenged, you need to challenge the moving party by virtue of their standing to bring the suit, number one. And number two, you challenge the jurisdiction of the court that they are not a court of competent jurisdiction. Because you don't have a court here locally, a court of competent jurisdiction. If you're confident about winning your case, then in essence you can instruct the judge that in fact he can rule in favor of your patent, but he can't rule against it. They hate to hear that. They want to have the power. Tragic what happens in our courtrooms. Okay? Exclusive jurisdiction in the common law Supreme Court, Article 3. When you see Article 3 of a court, that means it's a constitutional court. Okay? Number 7. Therefore, the said land remain unencumbered, free and clear, and without liens or lawfully attached in any way, and is hereby declared to be a private land and private property, not subject to any commercial forms, i.e. or e.g. UCC, in other words, Uniform Commercial Code. In other words, you're saying you're not in commerce. That falls under administrative jurisdiction. You're under common law. Your statement for the record, whatsoever. Number 8, a common law of courtesy of 60 days is stipulated for any challenge or two, otherwise latches and estoppel shall forever bar the same against said allodial. Remember our allodial? What does that mean? You're king of your land, aren't you? Owing to no one. Freehold estate, assessment being therefore, and to the contrary notwithstanding, therefore declaration after the 60 days from this, from the date, if no challenge are brought forth and upheld, perfects this allodial title in the name or name forever. 